Okay, I will start this event. Good, uh, assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, after uh, good morning, everyone. First of all, let us pray and praise to Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala because of His bless and mercy. We can meet together without any obstacle here with a healthy condition in uh, the guest lecture of what IVF update research and clinic. The Honorable Professor Dr. Mirni Lamit, DVM Magister Agriculture, as Dean of Faculty Veterinary Medicine, Arlangga University. The Honorable Professor Dr. Wijiati, DVM Magister Science, as Head of the Department of Veterinary Medicine. The Honorable Dr. Epi Muhammad Lukman, DVM Magister Science, uh, as Head Division of Anatomy Veterinary. The Honorable Dr. Liao Xie Yuan as guest lecturer from Virtus Fertility Center Singapore. The Honorable Lecturer of Faculty Veterinary Medicine Erlangga University and the Honorable Student of Faculty of uh, Veterinary Medicine Erlangga University. Ladies and gentlemen, I am Adiana Mutamasari Witaning Room. I welcome to this uh, guest lecture. And before we come to the main session, let us start this uh, event by praying first. So the event that we we'll, uh, hold on this day will run well without any obstacle at all. Pray based on individual belief. Pray begins. Then, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. On this uh, nice occasion, let me deliver the structure of uh, the event to this. Uh, as follows, uh, the first opening and the second speech from Professor Dr. Mirni Lamid. And the third, the general lecture will be delivered by Dr. Liao Xin Lian from Virtus Veterine Fertility Center mm -hmm. Singapore. The, this uh, Virtus Fertility Center is the best fertility medical center in Asia Pacific. And the fourth, the question and answer session and the last uh, closing. Now we invite Professor Mirni to give speech and Professor Mirni, time is yours. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Dr. Adiana Mutamsari. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. The honorable invited guests, lecturers, and all my students, warm welcome to everyone. Good morning, everybody. On behalf of our faculty, I extend a very science Sincere warm welcome to all of you who are here on special occasion for a guest lecture organized by the Anatomy Division, Faculty of Veterinary Medicine, Universite, Universitas Airlangga. Uh, the topic presented by the speaker today is very important for the development of the... <coughs> I'm so sorry. It's very uh, it's very important for the collaborate uh, for the increased opportunity for the development of IVF programs. I hope this guest lecture can increase knowledge for students as well as lecturers. The title of the topic today that uh, will be presented in this morning is I F I if I F V IVF, I'm so sorry. IVF update research and clinic. And I think the topic is very interesting. And I hope from this uh, guest lecture, we can increase the development of IVF program. The IVF program is currently is great demand by the mothers in Indonesia. So this topic I think is very important. I think I think that resource person, Dr. Liu Sui Lian, who has expected our invitation, and I want to say good morning, Dr. 
Leo Sui Lian. Good morning and regard for you or for you and I hope you can enjoy and thank you very much. You can join with us. He is uh, the Virtuous Fertility Center in Singapore. The special moment is also the first step for us to start a make collaboration in research. We hope our cooperation will not stop until today. For Dr. Liu Sui Lian, we really need you and your institution future support our faculty. We hope we, hope we can expand and strengthen our cooperation. Finally, enjoy your lectures and get a lot of knowledge from this program. Thank you for the head of division anatomy, Dr. Epi Muhammad Lukman and team, and also <clears throat> thank you, Professor, uh, for the Professor Wijati that always support this program. Thank you for, uh, very much uh, for everybody, and wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you for the speech delivered by Professor Mirni. And first of all, please allow me to take a picture of this event. So please turn on all your camera. We will screenshot the slide one until the last. Please turn on your camera for uh, all participants. Okay. Please. Uh, turn on. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I will turn a screenshot. One, two, three. Okay. The next slide. One, two, three. And the last. Okay. Thank you. And after uh, and in this session, we have one distinguished lecturer. This lecturer uh, will be guiding by Dr. Yeni Damayanti, DVM Magister of Health. She graduated of her bachelor until doctoral program from Airlangga University. Her research area oh. is on animal morphometry, animal photogrammetry, and veterinary acupuncture. She also joined in Indonesia Anatomy Expert Association Reviewer Veterinary Journal and Reviewer Journal of Veterinary uh, Medica. She has book chapter about introduction to veterinary anatomy, hinlim anatomy topography, and cranial extremity. And she has many pub, uh, publication. And without any further ado, please welcome Dr. Yeni Damayanti, DVM Magister of Health, for guiding to this lecture to Dr. Yeni, time is yours. Okay, thank you, Dr. Mutamsari, Adiana Mutamsari, the Honorable Our Dean, Professor Mini Ramit, the Honorable Our Speaker, Dr. Lau Siulin. Uh, thank you for your coming to our faculty and good morning, everyone. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Yeni Damayanti and welcome to our guest lecture series. Today we have distinguished speaker, Dr. Leo Swilian. Dr. Swilian, how are you today? I we hope you have a great healthy now. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Looking forward to, to see you all and uh, very happy to see you all too. Yeah. Alhamdulillah, thanks to God. Uh, I clap. I'm glad to hear you. Okay, today we have the same speaker, Dr. Liu Sui Elian from Virtus Fertility Center in Singapore. Before the lecture begin, let me introduce our speaker, Dr. Liu Sui Elian, a scientific director, Virtus Fertility Center in Singapore. He has academic career, Doctor of Philosophy, Reproductive Genetics. National University Singapore, Master of Science, Reproductive Biology, National University of Singapore, Doctor of Veterinary Medicine, University of Agriculture, Malaysia. Research area, 
intracytoplasmic sperm injection, IMSI, polarized like microscopy, oocyte, laser assisted hatching, laser micromanipulation technique. His active trainer, Ross, postgraduate students, I'm so sorry. Can you hear my voice, everybody? Yep. Yes. Thank you. It's great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, postgraduate students in Master in Clinical Embryology, National University of Singapore, and three IVF Center in Singapore. Professional qualification, Human Embryonic Stem Cell Culture Method, Weiser Research Institute, Wisconsin, USA, Pre-Implantation Genetic Diagnosis, PGD, University College London, United Kingdom, Laser Micromanipulation, University of Heidelberg, German. Organization, member in the Aspire Embryology Special Interest Group, Working Committee. He also hold membership in SRE, ASRAM, and PGDES. He has many publications and have a high index. Okay, everybody. Dr. Leo Swillian will explain about IVF update research and clinic. Yes, Dr. Thank you. Okay. Before we continue, let me remind you, if you have a question, please through the chat room. And uh, Dr. Leo Swian, you have at least 45 minutes for presentation. And the Zoom is your. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, professors, uh, Dr. Diana, uh, fellow lecturers, and uh, students. Okay, um, this for your information. Um, uh, my session may be a bit longer. And uh, as you know, you see my first uh, uh, degree is a DVM. I'm a, a, a bad student, a bad graduate. And, uh, and uh, somehow I'm, I'm, I'm going towards a, a human med medical uh, uh, training. I mean, facilities doing IVF. So most of the things that uh, I've done have uh, been in this uh, IVF uh, uh, research and uh, practice for almost 30 years now, 32 years. And I started off in the uh, uh, National University of Singapore. Uh, that time, it was a very uh, pioneering uh, IVF, and we did a lot of work, research in mouse models. As well, I collaborate with Singapore Zoo to do some IVF in the wildlife animals, like tigers, pandas, and all those things like that. So now, um, what I'm trying to share with you now is, uh, based on the human IVF because there's a lot of development and research uh, put into it. And I'm going to just highlight uh, certain aspects of uh, research that I think can help the interest, the faculty, as well as the students. And, and in fact, uh, personally, when I, let's say, if I, I'm the recruiter, I would prefer a vet a graduate to work in the human IVF because they are more, they have both uh, advantage. One, it has the clinical aspect as well as some uh, other knowledge uh, they can uh, really uh, pursue. Yeah. And uh, a lot of vet, uh, vet graduates have become uh, uh, clinical embryologists in this field, which is a very uh, niche uh, profession. And I think in Indonesia, we need a lot of these embryologists uh, to, to help. Uh, uh, couples who try to have children, all right? So now, um, without uh, wasting too much time, I'm going to go into the details now. Now, first of all, I'm going to share with you a bit of um, the background, how IBF became, uh, became uh, um, as you know, you all started off in, 19, in 1668, and you look at this uh, historical aspects, from you know how the uh, the graph uh, look at the testes and then the follicle structure and so on, and later on, uh, you know find out how sperm fertilize egg and all the things like that. So this is historical, 
So uh, I, I'm not going to uh, uh, highlight on too much, this those much. Now, when it comes to assisted reproduction or IVF, of course we talk about the sperm and the egg. Yeah. So in in the medical term, we call it the oocyte or oocyte. We don't call it an egg here. Yeah? So sperm, of course, it is development in how to identify good sperm, how to freeze the sperm, how to prepare the sperm or harvest the best sperm from the sample, and then use it for AI in animals or in human, it means uh, intrauterine uh, insemination, IUI. And then from there, in animal aspect, you use it for AI and then inseminate. Then after that, you get the embryos, you flush out the embryos, and then you can use that to uh, transfer to surrogate animals to get more uh, more uh, calves or more uh, lambs or some of the embryos then you go into freezing and then store for future use and then thaw and then put the embryo transfer. Now as for the eggs, oocyte, and for some of the best students, I'm sure you go to the abattoir, you collect all the, all the cow ovaries, uh, and then you harvest the immature eggs and you try to you know, mature them in vitro in the lab and then use uh, IVF, get the sperm from the wool, fertilize them in the laboratory, grow the embryos, transfer or freeze, right? This is basically, so all the res early research work come from animals. Now, um, basically what do you mean by fertilization? Simply fertilization means the union between uh, sperm and the egg. Now what you see here, is a human egg, all right? So the, the size of, I'm talking more on the aspects of the human, I'm, I apologize because I, I have uh, uh, do a lot of research work in anim, uh, humans now, yeah? So, um, so on the left side is a human egg, and you know the size of a human egg is just the size of a full stop on the pinch of paper. So what you see here is uh, as, uh, magnified 5,000 times, and it looks like a tennis ball, and if you look in the center here, extrapolate out, you see the sperm are attaching on the eggshell or zona pellucida before going and fertilize the egg, all right? Now, once the egg has been fertilized, this is the final stage of embryo development, the blastocyst, whereby this is the, before this embryo uh, uh, implant and develop into an um, uh, uh, fetus, yeah? All right, so now you notice here, the, the zona pellucida, there are a lot of so-called hair-like structures. Now, these hair-like structures play a very important role because when the egg is ovulated into the fallopian tube or into the oviduct, these hair-like structures emit chemical signals to let the sperm know where it is. So the egg will say, hi boys, I'm here, come over here and reach me and fertilize me, all those things like that, okay? Without these hairline structures, the sperm do not know where to go, all right? Now, this is a blastocyst, we call it, and it's a very well-defined uh, embryo, whereby you can see one group of cells here. This is known as uh, ICM, inner cell mass, which gives rise to embryonic stem cells, yeah? And this is the trophectodum, right? So this one will give rise to the baby. This one will give rise to the placenta. So the aim of the IVF program is to grow, fertilize the egg and grow the embryos to this blastocyst stage. Now, the process of fertilization, normally if it happen, the sperm will swim here in a group of cumulus cells. Now, cumulus cells are cells that provide nutrients to the egg, all right, to make sure that the egg can grow well and uh, able to be ready to be fertilized when it's ovulated from the follicle. And then the sperm will come in and uh, try to uh, you know that the sperm, the head contains an acrosome that contains an enzyme. And this enzyme will help the sperm to drill a tunnel through before going in and fertilize the egg. So basically, this is the process of natural fertilization. Now, it seems very simple, but there are a lot of problems uh, affecting uh, uh, this fertilization in terms of the, either the sperm quality or the egg quality, especially in humans, yeah? Now, so what are the factors? Both factors, either sperm or egg. 
So let's talk about the sperm first, yeah? Now, as you know, sperm is derived from the testicle. Now, for human, the testicles are all, or for all mammals, in fact, the testicles are outside our body. It's a very good reason for that. Because for good sperm production, it got to be two, at least two degrees Celsius cooler than our body temperature. So for all young men in the, in the, who are listening now, please make sure that your growing area is cooler. Yeah, Don't wear tight pants or uh, tight jeans that look very smart, but it heats up your testicles and your sperm production drops. Yeah, All right? Now, when you open up the testicle, it composes a lot of tubes called seminiferous tubules. And if I were to take out a piece of this tubule out and dissect it, that's what you see here. So a sperm is derived from a single cell, okay? From, uh, 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 okay, and then, you, and then differentiate into a spermatid and then from slowly into a mature. All right? Now, uh, once the sperm are produced, then they are stored, they migrate and store in this organ here. This organ is called epididymis, whereby the sperm are stored until the sperm are ejaculated. So there are a lot of factors around here. Once the sperm are stored here, there's always a risk of the sperm being damaged uh, by some uh, toxicants that the person injected, uh, ingested or animal exposed to some toxicants that can destroy the sperm, yeah? So there are a lot of factors involved here. Now, Animals, humans produce millions and millions of sperm. But in humans, only a small percentage of the sperm have normal morphology. Normal morphology means sperm that have good form, that can be able to stream towards the egg and fertilize the egg. So a normal sperm, uh, sperm with normal morphology will have the, the shape of an oval egg. All right, this is the, the egg contains the DNA, uh, DNA. And the pink one is said an acrosome, acrosomal cap that contains the enzyme that helps the sperm to drill a tunnel through uh, the eggshell before going and fertilize the egg. And the neck here basically is, a, is rich in mitochondria, gives energy to the sperm, and also a centrosome that is important for uh, uh, separation of chromosomes during the development of the embryo. So the tail is said to help the sperm to stream towards the egg. Now, the deformed egg sperm, there are many. It can come in terms of head problems, too large head, too small head, neck problem, or tail problems. So all these defective sperms have a, a, a difficult, a difficulty uh, swimming towards the egg or fertilizing the egg. Yeah? Now, in human, the WHO minimum requirement is this sperm concentration. So men who produce less than 60 million are considered not enough sperm to fertilize his partner's egg naturally. Motility means progressive. How many, how many percent of sperm can swim forward? They can go and fertilize the egg. Vitality means how many percent of sperm that are alive? Because when they each ejaculate, not every sperm will be alive. So there will be a certain percentage that the sperm are paid. Yeah? So if the percent maternity falls below 54%, that means Maybe the man has something uh, is, uh, exposed to certain things that can cause a sperm to die. Yeah? Um, morphology, minimum 4%, good form. Yeah? Now, now, let's talk about more process of fertilization. So when the sperm comes in, it drill, it, 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 it re, that does a strong reaction, then it drills through the tunnel and it goes in. So then, at that point, the sperm membrane and the egg membrane will fuse. Now, the sperm carries a very important protein factor. All right, now, it's commonly known as cytosolic factor. Now, as you know, when the egg is ovulated, the egg is sleeping. All right, so you need something like a alarm bell to break the egg. So, what happens during the fusion of the sperm membrane and the egg membrane? The sperm release that protein factor called uh, PLC zeta. And then this will go in and wake up the egg and, 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 and cause uh, you know, increase in uh, or release of uh, intracellular calcium from the calcium stores in the egg and trigger the process of fertilization. 
So this process is very, very complex, but I'm not going to uh, go in detail because uh, time is a factor here. But I'm trying to, try to say here is this, this is just a diagram here to show you, yeah, whereby initially when the protein comes, they should see a wave, yeah, from here it goes, uh, and then see a sudden wave. And this will trigger a tsunami wave to trigger the process of uh, uh, fertilization, yeah. Now, then the main problem here also comes in. Now, they are, we, we come across a lot of men having, uh, you know, even though the sperm count is good, the shape is good, but some of them, they lack the protein factor, PLC zeta, to fertilize the egg. So what you see here, the trigger here, these are patients who have normal fertilization. You mean the sperm, they have good protein factor, and this one here has poor fertilization, all right? So when, when we, when we, do, when we uh, do a diagnosis, we look into all these factors. Now, in addition to that, you men can have high, good uh, the process protein factor, but there are some of them they have some mutation in their protein. So the mutation can cause the uh, result in poorer fertilization or no fertilization in human. Yeah. Now, another factor where it's very important is very commonly found now. I see a lot of men doing uh, having this problem now. Now, of course. You know, uh, as we know, in, in, in since uh, secondary school, we have been told by a biology teacher that the job of the sperm is just to get in, fertilize the egg, that's it, uh, finish. But now there are a lot of medical evidence that shows that the sperm has a major impact on the outcome of pregnancy as far as the first three months of pregnancy in human, the first trimester, all right? That is because of the DNA quality. Now, what you see here, these are the four electron micrographs of four sperm head. Now, the dark matters are the DNA material. Now, as you know, at every moment we are taking in toxicants into the body. The toxicants go to the blood system, generate what we call free oxygen radicals. Now, these free oxygen radicals or reactive oxygen species they love to attack DNA of any cells, including the sperm. So when they go in, they break down the DNA and then they create empty spaces in the head like this. So what you see here, sperm number one, number two, number four, badly damaged. So this one will have an impact on the outcome of embryo development. Yeah. So what you have, you see these two embryos here, were derived from sperm that had badly damaged them. All right, now so much so you can't reach the blastocyst stage. Now, even this embryo, let's say, managed to reach the blastocyst stage, if, the, if the, the woman gets pregnant, then she has a high risk of miscarriage in the first three months. Now, how do we overcome this? How do we diagnose it? Yeah, how do we look at uh, the man having, uh, the looking at his sperm, how good the DNA quality is? Now, one of the tests for DNA quality in the sperm is known as halosperm assay, is sperm chromatin dispersion test, yeah? So what happens is that when the sample will be treated with chemicals to break down the cell membrane so that the DNA of the sperm is uh, released. So what you see here, this is the sperm head, is chromatin, chromatin is spread out. When it's spread out, it causes what you call a, a, a halo, all right? Now the size of the halo can tell you the quality of the sperm DNA. So when a man comes in, before, the, before it comes to the IVF program, the doctor will prescribe this one of the tests, yeah? To look at how healthy the sperm is. So the, lar the, sperm, the larger the halo, the better it is. So this one tells me this sperm has good DNA. This one, about 50% of the DNA has been damaged. This one, dead sperm, 100% damaged. So what happens is that the embryologists will look at the percentage of how many sperm that have small uh, halo plus percentage of sperm that have no halo to derive an index, which is known as uh, sperm DNA fragmentation index. So whereby the smaller the percentage, the better it is. Now, what could have what are the factors that can cause sperm DNA to damage? One of the main factors is uh, smoking. 
Cigarette smoking can cause sperm to degrade. Too much alcohol consumption can also. Chronic exposure pollutants in the environment. Yeah, uh, the environment in the air or environment in the workplace, like those working in the oil and air, uh, chemical industries. Yeah? Exposure to radiation, like those working in the IT industries. I see a lot of men in the IT industries having this problem. And the airline industry, the pilots and the stewards having this problem. Now, even I just have the advice to our fellow uh, male colleagues here that most of us nowadays spend a lot of time sitting down in front of a computer. So when you sit down too long, the growing, your area, the growing area is heated up. That can also cause sperm DNA to degrade. So every half an hour, if you can, just step out and spend two to five minutes walking around to cool the air. All right? Now, the causes here, as I mentioned, there can be a lot of factors here. Exposure to xenobiotics, the occupational, therapeutic, lifestyle, or some defects in this spanogenesis. High level of radio frequency radiation can cause this also. Scrotal heat stress if you sit too long. Uh, aging, it could be. Uh, it's a man uh, advanced in age, the DNA quality should drop. Then all this generate oxidative stress and so on and so forth. And DNA damage. If your if egg is fertilized, the egg, the wonderful thing about the egg is that the egg can correct the mistakes of the sperm DNA. All right. But if the DNA uh, damage is too much, more than 10%, the egg cannot correct it, to, and there will be some damaged genes in there, and that affects the, the embryo development and uh, outcome of pregnancy. All right. Now, what happens? Because we don't see all these things in animals, because you know animals have uh, you know all those animals that are the male, the bulls, they are produced very well. They usually get by studs, and those that are not good, they are cow. Yeah, but in humans, we cannot cow them. All right, okay. Humans, you know, life is precious, so there are men who have no sperm in the ejaculate. So what can we do? What are the causes? So in no sperm, the, the term is known as azoospermia. So there are two causes of uh, exospermia. One is known as non-obstructive exospermia. The other one is obstructive exospermia. All right. Now this is obstructive exospermia means what happens for the causes? It could be because the sperm duct, yeah, the vas deferens, has been slipped off because of vasectomy, or there's some uh, the the fiber uh, the 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 LV duct has become, you know, very fibrous. Sperm cannot go out. Or some men are born without a vast deference. So sperm production is normal, but the sperm cannot exceed in the ejaculate. All right? Now, the next one is non-obstructive. Non-obstructive means everything is there. The, 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 the duct is all patent and everything. Yeah? But... Uh, sorry. Uh, but the... Uh, but the sperm production is affected. So how can we overcome this? All these things, we have to go for surgery. So the man will have to go for surgery, extract some uh, testicle tissue, get the sperm, and use that sperm to fertilize the egg by injecting the sperm into the egg. And the remaining will be stored in the uh, frozen and be stored for future use. Yeah? Now, there are other factors that affect sperm male infertility, and those are all the genetic factors. The very common one is the Y chromosome microdivisions, where certain, certain part of the genes uh, in the Y chromosome that are responsible for sperm production has been uh, removed from birth. Yeah. Now, just in summary, to me, sperm quality is more important than sperm count in IVF in human. Uh, fragmentation of uh, sperm DNA, high DNA fragmentation can fertilize the sperm, but it will generate poor outcome. Yeah, and sperm selection will lower the risk of passing on an abnormal paternal genome into the next generation. Now, this is all about the sperm. Now, let's talk about the oocyte. Now, this is how a human egg looks like when it's uh, taken out from the follicle or ovulated. Now, that's like in this, if we look at the, the cow's uh, cumulus mass, OCC or COC, cumulus oocyte complex, 
Now, this is the atm, and it's surrounded by a lot of cumulus cells. Now, the two cumulus cells have two functions. One is for uh, sperm selection, where the sperm try to penetrate, only the best sperm can go in and fertilize the egg. The second one is to provide nutrients for the egg so that the egg can be uh, uh, ready to be fertilized uh, when it's ovulated. Yeah? Now, to prepare the egg for fertilization, we have to remove all these cells so that you can see the egg proper. This is a human egg. Now, this is the egg shell called zona pellucida. This is the egg proper, the plasma membrane, uh, the uplasm or cytoplasm. And this is the first polar body that tells you that this is a mature egg. All right. Now, after collecting the eggs from, from now, oocyte quality also affects fertilization, how good it is, and embryo development in plantation. So, how do we uh, determine the best potential? This egg burden has a good potential to become uh, uh, a good embryo. Of course, one thing is the oocyte maturation, whether it's a mature egg, how complete. Second one is the morphology of the egg, how good it is. And the third one, how competent it is to become, uh, uh, can grow into a, a good embryo of blastocyst and implant and give rise to a healthy uh, baby. Now, this is just to show you the different stages of uh, oocyte maturation. We start off with the germinal vesicle, which is very, very immature, and it's in the ovary, and then raised to metaphase one. So when it's ovulated, it's metaphase two. All right. Now, a very important part here is that the cumulus mass here, as I mentioned, it provides nutrients and other factors for the egg to grow. There is, in, there is intimate interconnection between the cells and the egg. All right. Now, in, like when you harvest the, the uh, eggs from the cow's ovaries for IVM, of, and then you look at certain eggs, the potential of it become a uh, meta, uh, mature egg. You look at the corona, the thickness of the corona, the thicker the corona, the better it is, right? You can see more uh, mature eggs being produced from those, yeah? All right, this I'm trying to show you that way. Now, oocyte developmental competence depending on how immature eggs. And in, the thing is that IBM eggs, immature eggs can give, uh, it's not so efficient. Most of the eggs will give rise to embryos that have uh, a lot of uh, defects, genetic uh, defects, because of genetic errors. Uh, post-mature, sometimes these eggs are already post-mature, means already past their, 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 their life that can be fertilized normally. Like in human, it got to be at least, uh, mean, should not be more than 10 hours after ovulation. Yeah? Oocyte activation, meaning that, you know, uh, what are the things that can affect poor fertilization? Damage inside the internally is the chromosome, whether it's a single or double strand breaks and the damage, this also affect the outcome later on. Maternal age. So in, in humans, we always advise the ladies to, you know, start all the couples to start the family as early as possible because in the advanced age, the quality of the, uh, the egg drops. Yeah, That's why women in their 40s uh, have difficulty having a live birth, yeah? And also the stimuli protocol, like in humans, is very intricate. So they, they customize the to, to, uh, stimulation so that you can produce sufficient eggs, that, that's enough, and the quality eggs to produce a good embryo. Now, this is just an example to show you some of the eggs that are defective in human. Now, this one here has a black spot. Yeah, they call this the big body. This one tells me that this egg has lower chance of being fertilized, but it can still give rise to a live birth if it's fertilized. Now, these are abnormal ones that give rise to genetically abnormal embryos, yeah, or high risk of miscarriage. This one, the egg shell is very, very thick. Now, the sperm can't penetrate. It's like Great Wall of China but it can give rise to a human uh, a life birth if it's injected into the egg. And all these, these eggs are all defective. You see the holes here, they're degenerating, and this is abnormal. 
So when we come across this type of eggs here, we don't fertilize them yeah, at all. Yeah. Now, the quality, as you know, aging has an effect, yeah. high stress, and all those things here. Yeah? Now, why aging has an effect? Because that also affects the mitochondria. Now, the egg has a lot of mitochondria. Mitochondria is the organelle that gives energy for all the physiological processes in the egg or embryo development. So as the woman gets older, there is a lot of damage to the mitochondria, so there is insufficient energy to provide for uh, embryo development or uh, genetic separation and all those things like that. Yeah? Now, in IVF lab, the technology is so advanced now. Now, in most IVF practice, what we, how do we you know, grade the egg? We grade the egg by looking visual assessment, right? So if you look at this human egg here, this egg looks good. Everything is good, good potential to give you a good embryo. But in now in, in IVF, human IVF practice, we, we are not that interested in that more. We are more interested in the meiotic spindle, they call it. All right? Meiotic, how healthy this spindle is. The, 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 the purple ones are the, are the spindles that are attached to the chromosomes. The white ones are the chromosomes here, the metaphase two, they're responsible for separating the chromosomes. So of course, uh, this one, we can't stain the egg with fluorochromes to look at it. In the end, we have nothing to be fertilized. So instead, we use light from the microscope that goes through a series of polarized filters and look at the health of this meiotic spindle. So now let's say this egg here, before this egg is injected with the sperm, we, had, we want to make sure that whether this spindle is healthy or not, by using the polarized light, we, it shows a bright spot and gives similar shape. So this tells me that this egg has good potential to give you a good uh, outcome, yeah? Low risk of miscarriage. Now, this egg here, it looks healthy, but there's some problem here. You look at it, the meiotic spindle is stuck between the first polar body and the egg itself. That means that separation of chromosomes is abnormal and it gives rise to genetically abnormal embryo, high risk of miscarriage. Or this egg here, it looks good externally, but internally the meiotic spindle has been broken into pieces. Then again, uh, there'll be aneuploidy. Aneuploidy means abnormal number of chromosomes in the embryo and this will give rise to uh, uh, pregnancy loss. So if we come across this type of eggs, we don't fertilize them. So we have patients who have always you know, recurrent uh, miscarriage, or every time they get pregnant, they lose their pregnancy. So when we look at that, then, then we can see a lot of defects in this, all right? Now, this is some, one of the examples. This is how a good one looks like. These are some examples of the bad ones. Yeah. So this technology has been in here for many years, at least 20 years already. So I started using this one uh, when the prototype came out from uh, US. And in fact, uh, we were the first one to use it in uh, outside US. Uh, we use it for uh, cloning. That time we clone in the, in the University, uh, National University of Singapore, we clone monkeys. So by looking at this, we can assess this one, you can remove this male spindle out and then uh, introduce a uh, uh, somatic uh, cell nucleus into the egg to generate clone monkeys. Yeah? Now, this is just to show you how it looks like. So, this is the meiotic spindle. These are the chromosomes. So this is a normal one. Now, for the oocyte or polarized uh, technology that you saw, it just helps us, it cannot be 100% accurate because you can only see the spindle here, you don't see the chromosomes. So this time the chromosomes are not aligned properly. So this one should generate aneuploidy. And these are the examples of other bad uh, uh, meiotic spindles. Yeah? Now, this is a human uh, karyotype chromosomes. All of us are made up of 46 chromosomes. So 23 pairs of chromosomes, yeah? Uh, 22 pairs of chromosomes and one pair, one set, one set of sex chromosome. 
the X and the Y. All right. So of course, this one comes from a male, or female will be 2X and no Y. Now you notice that the Y chromosome is getting smaller and smaller and very fragile. Yeah, because the Y chromosome is the most fragile chromosome among in the human. So what I postulate is that over maybe another few hundred years or thousand years, there won't be any more men alive. Yeah, they only have women. Yeah. Okay, so you have to think of other ways to propagate human. Yeah. Now, this is just to show you an example of a Down syndrome uh, person who has an extra chromosome 21. This, is, this extra chromosome usually comes from the egg that is unable to, set, to, to separate out the equal distribution of the chromosomes during uh, fertilization. Now, in summary, uh, optimal maturation of the oocyte depends on the environment and determines embryo competence. Mitochondrial function provides energy, and this is also affected by the age. Also, the ovarian reserve. The ovarian reserve means how many eggs are being stored in the ovaries. Now, for the ladies, when, when, the, when a woman is conceived, she has been given a fixed number of eggs, ranging between 1 million to 2 million eggs yeah, in both ovaries, yeah, total. Now, as the woman reaches puberty, the number of eggs drop to by half. Let's say start up with 1 million, by then she will have 500,000 eggs. Then, but, but you've been told that every month you're going to ovulate only one egg. But actually, it takes a few eggs to get one egg ovulated. So let's say about 10 eggs, 10 follicles have been recruited for in the cycle. But only one egg was ovulated, the remaining nine will uh, degenerate and lost. Yeah, that's why, you know, as a woman uh, uh, in advance in age, the number of eggs reserved uh, in, in the ovary drops. Yeah, chromosome segregation that also affects the mitochondria because the energy to separate out the chromosomes evenly is not enough as a woman gets older. That often because, because of that, the embryo and may not be able to reach the blastocyst stage. Yeah. Um, let's talk about assisted reproduction. This is very interesting, right? Now we have assisted reproduction means uh, techniques. Of course, IVF, as everyone knows, IVF means you just make the egg and the sperm together and allow them to fertilize naturally. And the second one is the intracytoplasmic sperm injection, which is now commonly used in all human IVF clinics by injecting the one sperm into the egg. And the latest one is intracytoplasmic morphologically selected sperm injection, IMSI. This is the latest one that has given very good outcome. Now, how to prepare sperm for IVF? Now, there are two methods in human preparation. One is just allow the sperm to swim towards the top. So the semen sample is placed on the bottom. Those sperm that swim to the top are considered healthy, good sperm. But to me, this is not the best sperm collected. I prefer the gradient of filtration method. Now, what you see here, the three columns here, these three columns are filters. They are, the difference amongst these columns here is the viscosity, how viscous they are. So this is 40%. 17, 90%, semen samples placed on top, and the tube is then placed in the centrifuge and then spun for about 10 minutes, yeah? All right? Now, let's say, for example, you start off with 10 million, at the end, you probably get 1 million, so majority of the best sperm are found at the bottom. The rest of the effective sperms are usually lighter, then they'll be thrown away. So this can be used for uh, IUI or artificial insemination. IUI means intrauterine insemination in human. Uh, yeah, which is like some similar to IUI, we deposit the sperm into the uterus, allow the sperm to go and fertilize the egg. Now, this is just to show you an example of a human sample, which is not processed yet. And this is to show you a human sample, the sperm sample that is very clean that is being used for uh, to fertilize the egg. Yeah. Now, in vitro, what are the limitations in human? Now, not every couple can go for IVF 
uh, in this the treatment procedure. That depends on the how, uh, the concentration. If less than 16 million, most likely there won't be any successful. The mortality and the sperm morphology. So if you if the sperm uh, 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 factors are below this level, then there's a high risk of poor fertilization or low fertilization. So when when first IVF was started uh, in the 1980s, that's what happens. So we see a lot of men uh, uh, with lower sperm count couldn't become a father. So the next thing is to try to find out how to uh, fertilize the egg. So then now. Before that, what happens is, is they just to show you the, 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 uh, the zona pellucida, and this is just to show you the sperm egg binding, which I showed you earlier. Now, in zona hardening, what happens is that when you do IVF, there is a zona hardening. But once the sperm, first sperm that goes into the egg, the, immediately the cortical granules uh, you know, release some cal uh, calcium or some factors that harden the sperm other than the, the zona pellucida, so that only one sperm can fertilize the egg, yeah? So this is how the egg is fertilized here, yeah? just to show you. All right, now, comes to the very exciting part, the in, uh, ICSI. So in, in these are some of the technical terms, you can see oligosuspermia means low sperm count, terato means abnormal sperm morphology, estinosuspermia means poor fertility, poor motility, but if you have men, you have all the three factors, oligo, turato, espinosuspermia. Now, XC can help to solve most of this problem because by injecting the sperm in, make sure that the sperm is inside the egg and this sperm has a good chance of fertilizing the egg. Yeah? But um, the thing is that it's a sperm selection. Sperm selection is not very thorough here, but in this one here, sperm selection is very strict based on selecting the best sperm, the healthiest sperm, with lower chance of DNA fragmentation. Yeah? Now, basically what happens in XC means you can inject any type of sperm in and get fertilized egg, get embryo, pregnancy can happen. Now, the IMSI. Now what you see here, this is the ICSI. You don't see much detail of the sperm. You just look at the sperm. Oh, okay, just be go in. For IMSI, you look at this sperm here. Now the sperm here, it, uh, 1,200 times. Now the head contains the DNA. If I see holes on the head or vacuoles, that means that this sperm had badly damaged the DNA. This sperm will be rejected. Then we look for a sperm that had no holes at all. We go in and fertilize it. This is the examples here. Now look at the embryo. Now this is just to show you how the embryo develops in the human. All right. Now, um, the human, the egg is ovulated, sperm come in, fertilized. So fertilization happens inside the fallopian tube or in animal in the oviduct. Yeah. So now once the egg has been fertilized, it's become an embryo, and this little embryo will need to travel down the tube to reach here. So it takes about five days to reach the uterus. So during the five-day journey, it develops more and more uh, cells and finally become a blastocyst, a very specialized embryo. Now, how do we grow the embryos in the laboratory? Now, this is the five-day development of the embryo. So the first day, how the eggs are fertilized, how you know it's fertilized. There are two pronuclei here, you call them zygote. Yeah, one's from the egg, one from the sperm, with all the fused form of true nucleus. So this is called a pronucleus, yeah? Second day, four cell, third day, eight cell, fourth day, a morula, that is 32 in there. <coughs> And then the fifth day, the blastocyst. Now, for those who are working in the lab, in the animals, they grow the embryos in the incubator. Incubators, when you open the door, shut, open, door, shut, yeah? <coughs> Sorry. Now, each time when you want to check for the embryo development, you open, put a microscope, then put them back again. Now, each time you open that, you expose the embryos in suboptimal conditions. So this affects the development of the embryo and the quality. But now the latest one in human, we use a time-lapse incubator, whereby each embryo is grown in a well like this, and there's a camera on top. So the camera will record the development, <laughs> sorry, development of the embryo from day zero to day five, without the need to take them out. 
Yeah, so they let them grow quietly. Now I'm going to play a video here of a human embryo. Maybe most of you all is the first time you watch how a human embryo grows. Yeah. So this egg has injected. So you see the appearance of the female pronucleus and the male pronucleus, the fuse, and then the divide. Now, the advantage of this uh, video here is that let's say you have a few good blastocysts, the IVF lab can play back the video and review how this embryo developed. And then the lab will give a score to the embryo. So the embryo with the best score will be put in first. All right, to give you a good outcome. All right, so... This is a human blastocyst. This is the ICM that give rise to the fetus. This that refracted them that give rise to the placenta. All right. So all of us come from this blastocyst. Okay? Now, this is just to show you during uh, you know fertilization embryo development what happens to the other factors, immunization and all these things like that. All the molecular development. Now this is how the incubator looks like. The time lapse whereby there's no need for us to take it out and check. This, uh, we can monitor in real time by through the computer. All right. And uh, this, this incubator is uh, very, very expensive. Yeah. Uh, it costs us 350,000 Singapore dollars. Yeah. It's a bungalow. Now, um, as I mentioned in human, as the woman gets older, the quality of the embryo drops. The blue line is the good quad embryo. The brown ones are the abnormal embryo. So at midpoint, 35. So that's why, you know, as a woman gets older, she has difficulty delivering a baby. Yeah. So that's over here. Yeah. In fact, Singapore by next year, they advise we they allow young girls, young women to store the eggs before they uh, find a partner or or before they before they want to start the family, yeah, as early as possible. Now this is implantation. This is the diagram here. When you put the embryo in, the embryo hatch out, and then implant into the endometrium where you get food from the mummy and it starts to grow. Now uh, we also, in addition to that, we also use laser to drill holes in the in the zona so that it allow the embryo to hatch out and implant. Okay, this is the black, this is the, the red dot here is the laser beam. And you can see uh, it's being created, the, the, the zona is being blasted by the laser. Yeah, all right. Yeah, you can see that. Yeah, it create a hole big enough so that the embryo can hatch out, yeah. Okay, so this is how the embryo hatch out the implant from each shell, the implant to the endometrium. So this is a three big old uh, gestational sac where the embryo is, is inside, yeah? fetus is inside. Now in human, what are the relative contributions to the successful outcome? The egg has a major impact because 70% of the egg, yeah, because the egg has all the necessary factors important for fertilization and embryo development and implantation all right the sperm only contribute 20 percent but it has a major role here by make sure they make, make sure that it contributes the good dna and the environment in the uterus is very important it will to be a natural environment no other uh, pathological uh, uh, findings in the uterus now, this is just to show you the first IVF baby, born Louise Brown. Yeah, now she's a grandmother. Yeah, and this is the professor, Bob uh, Edwards. Yeah, he's the first man who produced uh, an IVF baby in the world. Yeah, <clears throat> and he's the first clinical embryologist. Now, this is to show you the laboratory here. It's a, a very clean room because IVF requires very clean air, clean room. So this is ISO certified clean room. And here, what you see here, these are the, what they call a crib, whereby the environment is controlled. So we handle the egg and embryo in there to minimize stress to the embryo. 
this is the place where we do the fertilization. Now, when once the embryos are produced, and then later on for transfer, this is where the patient will sit down here. The patient can see the embryo before being loaded and put it in the catheter and put it into a uterus. Yeah, very simple. Now, this is just a laboratory again to so show you this is a section here for sperm production, uh, uh, sperm preparation for IVF. This is where you handle the embry embryos and egg and all sperm fertilization. This is on the bench top incubators, the box incubators. Uh, which we use to grow them in, but we use a time lapse. This is where we store the embryos in liquid nitrogen for future storage. Now, once you store the embryos, the embryos are stored uh, uh, in time, stopped in time. Now, let's say if a woman is 30 years old and you freeze the eggs of the embryos, the egg the embryos will be 30 years old forever. All right. And uh, now the research development. There are some, I'm going to hide some interesting research development. Now, there are a lot of uh, talk about now, because some embryos are good, then patient get pregnant, but then uh, uh, pregnancy loss. So how can we uh, make sure uh, the embryo is a healthy one? So one of the ways, of course, is to remove some cells from the propectrum and do a diagnosis. That is called uh, pre-implantation genetic testing. But that is very invasive. So what happens is that now, uh, there's a research going on whereby when you grow the embryo in the culture medium, the embryo may secrete some uh, metabolites or some removes, uh, excrete some cells. And this one can be used to test how good the embryo is and to assess the grading of the embryo before you put it in. So this is still ongoing. It's still under research work. The second thing, another thing is that, if you, I'm sure you, you have heard before many few years ago, whereby, especially in the mouse model, whereby you can get the skin cells from the mouse, from the tail, and then convert them, we call it induced pluripotent uh, stem cells, convert them back to stem cells. Yeah? And then using their stem cells and make them into, convert them into sperm. And then this, then using that sperm, the uh, uh, IPS cell derived sperm, and fertilize a normal uh, mouse egg and give rise to little mouse pups, right? Okay. Or now, in fact, they have also discovered that you can use these uh, skin cells, uh, in, uh, IPS stem cells from the skin cells, and then make into eggs and use a normal sperm to fertilize the IPS derived eggs and give rise to pups. Now this model works very well for, for the mouse. Now research has been ongoing to see whether we can do it in a primate, yeah? So in the future, this may, in one day, uh, it work and then it goes and the doctor is So the research is ongoing, yeah? So now, what are the future, uh, future uh, challenges? Now, bioinformatics and bioengineering are very important now. Now, everything now is using AI, a microfluidics and everything. So AI is already in the, uh, medical field, yeah? So eventually, uh, all, all the, the selection of the uh, embryos for transfer and everything will be uh, done by AI, right? And then there are some, all these things like human fertilization, when you see not XC injected, eventually the probably uh, AI, AI will control it, yeah? And this is the USA I'm talking about, this is how to select the sperm using the, uh, this AI to help you select a good sperm to fertilize. And this is, as you've seen before, now this incubator here, now is already incubated with an AI. So you recommend to the lab which embryo for transfer. But then again, the final decision will be uh, done by the lab itself, not the AI, yeah? Now, in future, there may be a lot of robotics here. Yeah, just uh, telling you, yeah? And, uh, there is highly technical, a lot of things here now. And in future, we call ourselves embryologists. You have not only acquired the basic knowledge, but you should, you know, communication skills, but research and development is very important here. All right. Uh, yeah. So I will encourage our fellow students in the faculty to maybe, you know, to, uh, go into this field. It's a very interesting, uh, a rewarding field because you help 
uh, childless couples to you know have children and make their life better. Yeah, all right. So clinical embryologist is a is a is a profession. All right. <clears throat> so I thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you, Dr. Su Dr. Liao. It is very, very, very interesting. <laughs> Your lead that you share to us, and I think it's uh, so useful for our student. Okay, now we enter to question session, and we look so many question at the chat room, totally. All. <laughs> and oh. first, uh, I will give the opportunity to the directly question. Okay, Ong. I think you was uh, you was one. Okay. Okay. Hello. First of all, Dr. Leo. Hi. I'd like. Hi. Can yeah. you hear me loud and clear? Yes, I hear you, Dr. Ong. Thank. I'd like to thank you very much for giving us this amazing lecture. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so my question is something regarding fertilization. Yeah. Uh, the sperm, in order for it to reach the egg, it needs to undergo chemotaxis, right? And chemotaxis is a chemical induced movement in which the egg releases something and the sperm, the motile cell, will detect and will go towards it. Yes. And my question is what does the egg release and what, what does the sperm use to detect something that is released by the egg? Thank you. Oh, that is uh, uh, it's still under a lot of research work, actually. Um, I think the eggs will just release some chemical factors, uh, physiological factors, protein factors that uh, attract the sperm. So uh, generally, we just call it chemo, chemotaxis. They don't, uh, we do not know. But I think there's one uh, research paper that has recently come out, uh, whereby uh, it's also, um, uh, I have not uh, have it here uh, with me, uh, but to the, that chemo, I have factors I, I can't I can't tell you at the moment. Yeah. 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 Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Leo. Mm. Thank you, Ong. Maybe uh two or more directly question. Okay, it's uh we continue with your question at the chat room. First from Sabila. Sabila Abani, wait for a minute. Too many. It's <laughs> <laughs> good, it's good, it's good. Yeah, there is a, okay. From Sal Sabila Abani. Good morning, Prof. Allow me to ask. I used to read that file fertilization may cause by failure in chromosome alignment. How to prevent failure in chromosome alignment during fertilization? <laughs> <laughs> That's, I think, a, a good question. <laughs> uh, how to avoid uh, failure in the chromosome alignment, all those things. Uh, this one we can't avoid because uh, this is innate. Uh, it, 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 uh, it happens inside, <laughs> so, uh, in, in the egg itself. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but sometimes it all depends on uh, how the, the handling of the egg itself. Now, let's say the egg, when it's retrieved, the, the spindle, the alignment is all very nice. But because the egg is very sensitive to temperature, sudden temperatures change, sudden pH change. So, so you have to be very cautious, very mindful of how to minimize that stress, right? Because when, the, when there's a sudden change in, let's say, temperature, let's say temperature is 37, anything below 37 or high 37, the meiotic spindle will just depolymerize, they just disappear, or pH change just disappear. So when it comes back to not 37, it will regroup again. So each time there's a thing, it may cause some spindles to misalign and then the chromosome separation will be affected. So handling of the oocyte is very important from the beginning. How to do that? Now, how do we do that? Because when you grow your embryo in the droplet, you overlay it with uh, uh, oil, mineral oil. This mineral oil has been, you know, served two functions. The mineral oil maintain the temperature when it's outside for a while, 37 all the time. 
Secondly, it, re it reduces the risk of dehydration of the culture medium. If the culture medium dehydrate, osmolarity increases, and that affects the, the air quality or the air quality. So all these things have to be beware and then try to maintain that. And when you take the egg, egg or embryo out to check, make sure as as the least exposure time. I mean, you take, you put it on the microscope, check, and quickly put it back. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we continue with the other question. Uh, Doctor Yani, sorry, okay. Doctor Yani. Uh, before Sikia. Talita. Yeah. Talita. 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 Okay. Okay. Sikia from Sikia, that is uh, Banyuwangi from Banyuwangi. Uh, is that abnormal sperm in tail like double tail or long tail can affect fertility? And how we can improve the normal sperm morphology? <laughs> okay. Now, um, first of all, there are two questions. Two things. The, the sperm with double tail, that means that you, you can swim very fast, double touch but it's already the defect in the mid piece, the centrosome. Now, in human fertilization, the male centrosome contributes to fertilization, contributes in the separation of chromosomes in the, in the, in the embryo, yeah, in the egg when you do fertilization. So now, if double tail means there's already a defect in the centrosome. So if it goes in, the embryo that is produced by the double tail sperm will be the, the separation of the chromosome is abnormal. So it gives rise to abnormal, uh, genetically abnormal embryo. Okay. Now, how to improve the morphology, the, the percentage of good sperm? Uh, for, for most men, I would say, have a healthy lifestyle, mean keep yourself healthy, yeah? Uh, try to reduce the stress level if you can, okay, by, you know, um, having sufficient uh, sleep, uh, all those things that I, and taking vitamins, exercise, that may help. Now, nutrition is very important for men and women. Yeah. Nowadays, you know, we think that we eat very healthy food, but is the because we are eating a lot of processed food and all those like McDonald's and all those things like that. Yeah. But most important, I'm sure in animal industry, animal nutrition is very important, right? So if you lack of certain trace elements that affect the quality of the gametes. So in other words, you make sure that you have um, balanced nutrients and you can, uh, you know, take some multivites or trace, they have trace minerals to, to improve the quality of the gametes other than the egg or the sperm. Okay, thank you for your answer. Uh, now we continue from Antonius Engel Vijaya. Are there any external factor that can make the zygote fail to develop in the IVF pass after fertilization? Again, sorry. Are they? Uh... Are there any external factor that can make the zygote fail to develop in the IVF pass after fertilization? Or oh, are there any external factors that after fertilization make the embryos fail to reach the final stage? You mean the embryo yeah. of the blastocyst? Yeah, yeah, my, my, yeah. my, my idiot. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So the other factors, um, though I would say uh, external factors, of course, internal factors you look at the quality of the egg and the sperm. That is uh, all internal. Yeah. But external factors like what? Like incubation factors. You will, because you grow there in the incubator. So now, you have to make sure that the incubator is consistently at that, let's say in human, 37 degrees, uh, 37 degrees uh, Celsius, yeah? And also you have to look at the uh, percentage of CO2. Now, uh, over here, the percentage of CO2 is 6%. That is to maintain the pH in the culture medium. pH got to be 7.2 to 7.4, yeah? So you have to make sure that it's that way. And then uh, other factors like, like how do you make sure that the, because the incubation is very important. Yeah? So how do you make sure that what you see in the incubator the indicator is exact, exactly 37, all right? So you have to use an external thermometer to put into the incubator to make sure that what you see 37 is exactly 37 by the external thermometer. The other one is to look at the CO2. Yeah, is it, is it ex ex exactly 6% CO2, all right? Now, 
the main thing is that because we get our gases from supplier, yeah, gases from supplier outside, yeah, are not filtered, not clean. But over here we have medical, even you say medical grade gases, there's, there's still a lot of uh, contaminants in there. So you have to have a filter, air, all those few gas filter externally outside the incubator to filter through if the gas filter, the gas using the HIPAA filter and the activated carbon filter to remove all the all the all the toxicants before this gas goes into the incubator. So, so this is the external factor. The another factor is the handling of the, the embryo and the egg. How you how the embryologist, how the, the lab person you know, handle the egg or you know or the embryo when you take it out from the incubator, all those things. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Doctor. Uh, next question come from Salsa Bila Safa. Uh, if any oocyte is look normal, is there any possibility that the oocyte is abnormal? Maybe you explain this. <laughs> no, this the, yes, uh, Is there an echo somewhere? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Did you hear some noise? Uh, okay. Oh, okay. Uh, Please unmute from. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, we, uh, now, I can hear you. The question is, uh, the egg may look normal. How do we know that the egg is abnormal if it looks normal? Is that what I mean? Is that what the question is? Okay. That is the question. Okay. Now, you see, as I, as I show you in the slide, uh, how now most of the time you look at the egg, the egg is normal, but to me, as I said, we use the, the technology called polarized microscopy, right? which I show you again. Yeah, we use this one to look at this because this is very, very important, right? Now, the egg itself, it can be looked right like this, even it's mature egg, yeah. Now there are some eggs that are uh, very granular, a lot of black dots in there. Let's say in the central, yeah. So if there are a lot of black, black dots, that means that the nuclear maturity is okay, is mature, nuclear maturity is okay, but the cytoplasmic maturity, the mechanism for fertilization for embryo development is not fully developed. So then you can see from there, all right, yeah. But the uh, most important for me is to look at this structure here. So that by using this technology, we you can use this structure to determine how good the egg is. All right. Yeah, any questions? Okay. Adi Nukroho, maybe you can unmute. Adi Nukroho, please. Okay, we continue, Dr. Liao. Yeah. Uh, from Dimas. Uh, how can smoking damage the quality of sperm? <laughs> oh, oh, yes. I'm sure this has been medically proven, yeah? Okay. Now, you see, when you spend a secret smoke, when you smoke, actually you're burning a lot of things inside. You, you breathe in sulfides, you bring all those things inside the system, all the toxicants inside. So what happens is these toxicants, will go in and generate a lot of what we call free oxygen radicals in the body. Yeah, uh, reactive oxygen species in the body. Now the body has a certain tolerance, I mean they can try to remove some of these free oxygen radicals in the body. But there are certain tolerance, once it goes beyond that threshold, then these this, uh, free oxygen radicals will go in and destroy the sperm or even other cells in the body. Yeah, and then we can give rise to cancer in other cells, but you can 
but you can uh, damage the sperm DNA. Because the sperm, the sperm is a very sensitive uh, cell. Yeah? And in the epididymis itself, where the sperm are being stored, that epididymis had a lot of blood vessels in there. So blood is stored, so the longer the sperm are stored there, these blood vessels, carry, blood vessels that carry the free oxygen radicals will damage the sperm DNA in that, in that storage. So this will affect the body. So I would advise that, you know, cut down on smoking or no smoking, yeah, in the long term. It's good for general health. I think I think Dimas is a smoker one. <laughs> <laughs> so he he has an idea to ask you about that. <laughs> okay, we continue from Laura. Uh, Laura asks you, did we have any solution for the abnormal product? or output from spermatozoa. Thank you very much. Do I have any solution? Solution for, for the abnormal project spermatozoa. Sperm spermatozoa, I think. Oh, so in other words, that uh, how to, you now basically is how to uh, uh, improve the sperm quality. Yeah. yeah. Uh, basically, as I said, how to improve sperm quality. Basically, if you look in terms of sperm count, uh, sperm count sometimes uh, it can be improved by being uh, taking some proper nutrients or health general health, but sometimes sperm count is genetically affected. So we, when it's genetically affected, we can't improve much. Yeah, in terms of that, but in terms of sperm morphology, sperm all those things are so sometimes it's most of the time it's also genetically affected. Let's say some we see a lot of men having a morphology. Uh, less than 4%. Yeah? Uh, Nutrition-wise, maybe can help a bit, but it may not improve tremendously. Yeah. Okay. That means the uh, preparation of the sperm is the success one for the... <laughs> yeah, yeah. So now words for IVF, we, uh, you have to separate out the good ones from the rest. And uh, okay. that's why... Uh, there may be just a few hundred thousand sperm good ones that is good enough to fertilize the by ICS okay. okay, thank you. Uh, next question from Sekar Cahya Kinasi. Uh, she asks you, what are the main cause of abnormal meiotic spindle? Then what is the impact of abnormal meiotic spindle? All right. <laughs> just like I mentioned before, the impact of, uh, you see, as I mentioned, uh, let me go back to the slide here, sorry. Um, yeah. Um, now, meiotic spindle, this is the, actually the whole thing is a meiotic spindle. These are the spindles here. Now, each of them is, at, at, at one chromosome is attached by one spindle. Yeah. All right, so now, if there's an abnormal, you see the spindle can be normal, but it also depends on how the chromosomes are aligned. So this is the metaphase two uh, meiotic spindle. This is a very nice alignment of all the chromosomes here. But if the chromosomes are aligned this way, so it will affect uneven distribution of the chromosomes in the embryo. Because when the embryo from one cell to two cell, uh, two cell to four cell, they keep on dividing, there'll be a cascading effect on, on this. So, so it's the how the how the chromosomes are aligned. That is very important here. So this one you cannot um, cannot change, cannot improve. This is innate in the egg itself. Okay, maybe we continue. Uh... Uh, from Naufal Eka Rahmansya, he asks about there are sperm that do not have an acrosome that cause sperm to be unable to penetrate the ovum. <laughs> yes, we have a lot of patients who have sperm. Now, this is not the sperm do does does not do not majority of sperm do not have uh, acrosome. That means it's a uh, uh, a chromosome sperm is a round headed sperm. All right. So, obviously, this sperm cannot fertilize the egg naturally. And also, one thing is that the lack of uh, 
a sperm factor. I mean, the, the one that uh, caused the activate the egg. I mean, they let the egg know that uh, the, the egg is being fertilized. The, the sperm factor, which I talked about, um, this one here, the activation here. All right. Now, this one comes from the sperm without any acrosome. So there's nothing there. So fertilization is almost zero. All right. So now, how do we overcome this? We we'll overcome this by injecting the sperm into the egg. And then we use uh, a chemical, all right, uh, called ionomycin that helps the egg to activate. This ionomycin means that it's just a facilitator. Now, in the culture medium, calcium is very important. So there will be calcium in the culture medium. So this ionomycin will open the channel for the calcium to go in from externally into the egg. And this will have more influx of calcium inside the egg than will cause a spike. And this will activate the egg fertilization will happen. That's how we solve the problem. Yeah. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, the uh, next question, maybe we have <laughs> limit time. No, uh, maybe... it's okay, yeah? It's okay, okay, thank yeah. you. From Roy Gilbert, ask you about is there any way to detect an abnormalities in an embryo before it has fully grown okay sure now if there are two now embryos if it's now normally if the embryo uh, can grow from day zero to the blastocyst all right so um now embryo development here let me just show you Sorry. Okay. Now, one thing to assess whether the embryo is good or not is from first day to the fifth day. All right. Now, before that, in fact, on the first day itself, see whether the, the fertilization is normal or not normal. Now, Abnormal, abnormal fertilization means you got to see two nuclei, one from the egg, one from the sperm. Now, abnormal fertilization means there's only one nucleus. All right? Or more than two. So this will be already tell already tell you that this, this embryo is not going to be good, genetically speaking. All right? Now let's say now you have two here, but the embryo development after a while is stopped growing or day three, I can never reach the blastocyst. That means there's something not right inside already. So the embryo cannot be shared. That means you better how you grow, you grow to another five, so two more days to, to the fifth day, you still remain at this stage. That means genetically this embryo is not healthy. All right? Now, then it comes to the blastocyst. Let's say you have reached the blastocyst. How do we know whether this embryo is a healthy one? Now, we, we grow the embryo through to this stage, yeah? Now, we also have a grading for this stage, for this embryo. Now, this is an AA grade, meaning that it's very good, very good chance of getting a pregnancy, yeah? Now, if you look at the embryo, that the, the, they say the ICM is very small, or the perfectum is very small. I'm so sorry, Mira, please. Unmute your speaker, please. Okay. Yeah. I'm so sorry, totally. No worries. Now, if we, when you, even you reach the blastocyst, we also must know the grading, how big the ICM is. So if the ICM is very small and not compact, all the cells are separated, that means that this embryo is not good. You have when not implant, give rise to a pregnancy or a pregnancy loss. Yeah. And this them also, we must have a very nice network of very good cell line, yeah, very clear, defined. So if the cell line is not good, that means it means embryo will not implant. So pregnancy will not result. So we have to do a lot of grading, all right? Now, now with the latest technology here, we can review the video. And sometimes the, the development may be just not straight all the time for five days. It may be some hiccups like this then we will know that this embryo may, may be a problem. So we will not transfer. So the new technology is there. 
So when AI comes in, AI will look into all this and recommend to the lab which embryo to transfer. AI means artificial intelligence. Yeah? Okay. Uh, there are still many questions, Dr. Liao. <laughs> I'm okay. I can be here until 12 o'clock. No worries. Singapore time. Okay. It's okay if we continue. <laughs> yes, please. I like, to, I like to share share my things like that. It's good that there are a lot of questions so that you know your students are very interested. Okay. Uh, uh, at the summary page, there is a point critical gain at the match up uh, human genomic activator at three days, uh, six till eight cell stage. Yes. Embryo development of failure is like like to occur. Is there any way to prevent the failure? <laughs> failure okay. or is it already another thing to happen? Thank you. Okay. Now, genomic activation. Now, what happens is this. Now, uh, now, for the first two, first day to the third day of development, the genes that control the embryo development is from the egg itself, maternal genes. Okay? So only on the day three afternoon, then the, the sperm maternal, mean the, the egg genes and the, and the sperm genes, the paternal genes, will come together a form of genome. So it's called genome activation, whereby then from there you can proceed to the blastocyst. So that's, that's why, as I say, is that the egg genes will be okay, but if there's something wrong with the sperm, on day three, the, the DNA of the sperm is no good, the, the embryo will not reach yet. That's why it's very important here, genomic activation. Yeah? Now, as the for those who work with the mouse model, you have all these like uh, four cell arrest. All right, those that try to grow the embryo, something oh, four cell stop, cannot go to blastocyst. What happened? Uh, it could be because of some handling in the embryos that, that affect the the genetic genomic activation to occur properly. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So all those things. Uh, Okay, Dadalia, there is a interesting question from Natsua Nabila Putri. Mm -hmm. She asks, is there any bad impact <laughs> when we offer using IVF? <laughs> is there when any we, impact? Yeah, yeah bad, bad impact when we offer using IVF. Oh, okay. Now, okay, <laughs> overusing IVF. Now, all right, uh, this is a major concern since the beginning of IVF. Yeah, so when uh, Professor Edward uh, produced the first IVF baby in Louis Brown, people will say, Oh, you are, you know, against Mother Nature. Yeah, but after a while, uh, you know, it becomes normal. And uh, we found that the babies that are born from IVF are usually healthy mentally and physically. Right now, that is for IVF, and you mix the egg and the sperm together. Now we have come across then later on men with poor sperm count, poor sperm quality who cannot become fathers using IVF. Then you have to use uh, injection, ICSI into egg. Now, then the people will query again. Okay, you inject the sperm into the egg without going through natural barriers. Natural barriers means the sperm will swim through the tubular cells, go, into the egg, go through the egg shell before going in. But the injection is just go through straight away. So they say that these men will have some problems, genetic problems, because they cannot fertilize the egg naturally. So obviously, babies born from there has higher incidence of abnormality. But the first baby born in, in using ICSI, ICSI is in 1992. Yeah. Now, since 1992, few millions of babies have been born all over the world, yeah, including here also. And I'm one of the pioneers who developed this IVF uh, ICSI in the world, yeah? Um, now, the babies that are born, they are as normal as those babies born, majority of them, uh, as, uh, as normal as those babies born from normal pregnancy in terms of uh, physical development and mental development, right? So there's no worry about that. Uh, of course, there are some uh, men or women uh, who could not conceive because of some genetic defects, yeah? Like, 
Uh, I'm sure those like thalassemia, which is the blood disorder, which is quite common in, in, in humans. So for those, and for those, then we fertilize the egg, uh, get the embryo, and then we do a, a testing. We call pre-implantation genetic testing, where we extract the cells from the we extract the cells from the trophectoderm here and do a testing to make sure that this embryo is healthy without the genetic defect before we put it in. Okay. Right? Yeah. So okay. generally speaking, uh, there's no overuse of IVF. <coughs> that sense. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's the, the majority. Just we assure you all that the the babies are healthy mentally and physically. Yeah, majority of them. Okay, Dr. Leo, there are still many in my chat box. Is twenty one <laughs> new message? <laughs> twenty one <laughs> new message, but uh, time is running out, so I have to end it before that. I will. Uh, resume this webinar first. Uh, wait for a minute. <laughs> okay, I think the uh, maybe uh, uh, this is one uh, question for Dr. Leo. Determination sex of the prospective baby is determined by the parent sex, chromosome, hormone, and Mullerian inhibition substance. Is there a way to be able to plan the sex? <laughs> this is the interesting question. Is there a way to be able to plan the sex of the child in vitro? <laughs> What's the answer? <laughs> well, okay. If uh, there's no been always a question for our patients also. Um, now, of course, I'm sure you know you have heard all those grandma stories that oh, you must eat certain fruits to get a boy, uh, eat certain things to get a girl, and all those things like that. Now, because the sperm, let's say for X, the, the sperm is has one either you have X X bearing sperm or Y bearing sperm. All right. So if the Y bearing sperm fertilize the egg, of course you get a get a male. X bearing sperm, you get a girl. Now. The uh, the Y sparing sperm is very sensitive to uh, pH. All right. So let's say if you eat a lot of uh, maybe pineapples and all those things that maybe in the uterine environment become a bit, a bit acidic, then the the male sperm may not survive. And all those things like that. So yeah. so then you may get more girls and all those things. It's just uh, not you cannot tell, but you cannot determine that way. Yeah. But for IVF itself, you can determine whether this embryo is a boy or a girl by, oh, as I, I mentioned see. before, you take some cells and do for genetic testing. But this is not allowed here yeah, in Singapore or even in Indonesia. Uh, embryo sexing is not allowed. Yeah? <laughs> yeah? Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is the resume for this uh, lecture. Assisted reproduction has already used for a long time historical by the understanding of reproductive biology. Assisted reproduction was followed by the preparation of the sperm and oocyte outside the body and ended with the embryo transfer. That's right, totally. <laughs> uh, yes. Fertilization is union between the sperm and the egg. The fertilization process begins when the sperm penetrates the ovum and the sperm will give enzymes to penetrate the egg wall, only a small percentage of the sperm have normal morphology, having oval shape from the head content to DNA, storing enzyme the neck contains the mitochondria that store the energy, spare problems varied from the head having its abnormal size and the other. And the other side, uh, the other side, the uh, the oocyte quality can be seen by oocyte maturity, morphology, and competence of the oocyte to grow into a good blastocyst. The cumulus provided the uh, nutrition for embryo growth, 
the thickness of the corona, the better the maturation of the oocyte. Developmental competence based on immature oocyte. In vitro mature oocyte, me meiotic error, post mature oocyte, oocyte activation, DNA damage, maternal egg ovarium aging. Uh, I think there is a point that I can reach from your lecture and once again, I do not hesitate to say thank you for you, Dr. Leo. Um, your time and your knowledge that shared to our student, to me. <laughs> and I hope that is uh, for useful for our student. And once again, thank you, Dr. Leo. Uh, uh, it is it's a, it's a pleasure to share, you know, my thoughts <laughs> and the, with the faculty as well as with the students here. And I hope the the my talk today have encouraged most of your students to think about IVF and maybe embark into some of this clinical embryology because uh, vet graduates make good clinical embryologists. Okay, yeah. okay it's a once high again, yeah? thank you, Dr. Leo. All right. And I would like to hand over back my duty to the our uh, master of ceremony, Dr. Adriana. Okay, it's yours it's... now. Okay, thank you. Dr. Thank you, Professor. Uh, thank you for guiding us in the in this lecture. I would say to thank you too for Dr. Liao Sri Lian. Uh, and everyone for attending today's guest lecture before I end this session on behalf of Father, Fa Faculty of Veterinary Medicine Erlangga University, I would like to hand over the certificate of appreciation to our distinguished lecturer virtually. So thank you, <laughs> Dr. Liao, for uh, interesting thank you. <laughs> lecture. Thank you very much. Thank and, you. Okay, you're welcome. And... Uh, we hope uh, can continue our co collaboration in the future. And the second certificate will be hand over to Dr. Yeni Damayanti, DVM Master of Health, for leading the lecture <laughs> smoothly. And finally, we get to the last session in this uh, event. Uh, let's close this event by Hamdala. Alhamdulillah. As, uh, as the master of ceremony, I would like to thank to Dr. Liao Suilian as the lecturer, Professor Mirni as dean, the committee, uh, Dr. Yeni as moderator, and the audience for joining us today entirely. May what we had conducted will be uh, useful for us. One more time, I say see you in the next event. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. See you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.